Good morning, Heartland community. Our community really enjoys meeting together. Uh, I can personally say that uh, coming together on Sunday mornings and seeing you face to face is one of the high points of my week, which is going to make this season of not getting together uh, as the greater corporate body, it's going to make it a challenge. Uh, there's no way around this. It, it feels like a loss to not come together regularly. But I do feel like this is the right decision to make. We are not driven by fear, but we are driven by love. Love for one another, love for our neighbors, especially our neighbors who are more vulnerable to the coronavirus. Uh, our goal in uh, taking this step is simply to just do our part to slow down the spread of this disease. And we, we play this part with uh, great faith and great optimism. Uh, again, no fear. Uh, there's an early church father, Dionysius, uh, lived in the third century. And there was a plague that was moving through his area, Alexandria. It was an awful plague. Uh, at its worst, I believe it was claiming about 5,000 lives a day. And Dionysius was seeing amazing faith and courage and love in the church. And he writes this about the people in his church. He says, most of our brother Christians showed unbounded love and loyalty, never sparing themselves and thinking only of one another. Heedless of the danger, they took charge of the sick, attending to their every need and ministering to them in Christ. And with them departed this life serenely happy. For they were infected by others with the disease, drawing on themselves the sickness of their neighbors and cheerfully accepting their pains. Again, I don't know what the Lord has for us, but I, I know that he's good. Uh, I know that it'll be difficult, but I also know that our community will rise to the challenge and we will face it with courage and uh, with love for one another. And I'm excited to go through that with you. It makes me think of what David wrote in Psalm 27. This is verse 1 and then verses 13 and 14. He said, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong. And let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Just as we begin together this morning, I'd like to pray. If you'll pray along with me. Father, I do pray uh, for our greater community that those of us who know you and we know the life we have in Christ and the life we have to come, that we would, we would operate by faith and by hope and not by fear. And from that, that life that you have given us, I also pray, Father, that you would make us courageous in how we love one another, uh, the sacrifices we are willing to make on behalf of others. Uh, help us to be very other-minded, just focused on the needs of those around us, uh, in our community, at, at Heartland, and even outside of our community. Uh, just show us needs that we can meet, and we will be eager to meet those needs. And we pray, Lord, just for that happy, serenely happy countenance of the early church when they faced uh, things like sickness and plagues. We just pray that uh, our same faith would produce that same happy countenance. We pray for our leaders. We pray for those in our community, in the medical profession, that are working so hard to care for us and protect us. We pray for wisdom. We pray for energy for them. We pray for their help, that you would protect them as they are loving and serving and caring for us. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as we begin this morning, uh, we're going to look at another passage in Luke. I want I want to ask you to imagine something with me. Uh, imagine that you're graduating from college and you have your reception 
and at your graduation reception, uh, a lot of people show up, they start giving you gifts, but your dad walks up to you and he gives you an envelope. And in that envelope, he has a letter in which he tells you that he's going to be giving you $1 million. And in the letter, it, it, it spells it all out, where the money's located, how to access it. Uh, he even writes in that letter, I'm giving this to you because I love you. And I want your life to be filled with amazing things. Uh, I want you to take family vacations and help your kids go to college. I just want you to have a great full life. And so here's exactly where to access this money. Now, let's say that you have a lot of other graduation gifts coming your way and you're excited about them. Some are big gifts and you read the letter quickly, but you put it in the envelope and you set it down and you kind of get distracted by all the other people there, everything else going on. And uh, the party ends. So after the party, uh, the next day, and uh, you enter life. And you start working, you start paying taxes, you start going through all the different challenges of life. And you realize pretty quickly that life is super expensive. Uh, the bills start stacking up. There's more uh, going out than what's coming in. And this really is your life, let's say, for the next 60 years. Uh, no treating the family to vacations. Uh, no purchasing a reliable vehicle. No helping kids with college. Uh, you pretty much live break even, if not in poverty, uh, for the rest of your life. And then imagine that, that you die. And the first person you see in heaven is your dad. He walks up to you, he's excited to see you, he hugs you, kisses you on the cheek, and then he asks you, did, it, did you enjoy that million dollars? Tell me about those family vacations. Tell me about where your kids went to college and how great it was for them to not go to college and come out with uh, great amounts of debt. Tell me all about how you spent that money. And you say, wait a second, uh, what million dollars? I, why didn't you tell me about this sooner, Dad? And in that moment, uh, your dad's going to say to you, I, I did tell you about it sooner. I, I put it in the letter. I told you everything in that letter about where it was, how to access it, uh, my hopes for how it would be a great thing for your life. I told you all about it in that letter. And He's going to ask you, why didn't you read the letter? Why didn't you take it seriously? I, I worry about us as a church at times. I worry about uh, a number of people that may be out there and they're going to church and they're maybe even carrying this book with them uh, when they go to church every week. And they're living in spiritual poverty. Uh, and there's more joy and there's more life and there's more peace going out than what's coming in. And I'm worried that they're going to get to heaven one day and they're, they're going to see God in heaven and God's going to say, hey, tell me, about, tell me about how amazing the life was that I gave you to live in Christ, in Jesus. Tell me about the peace and how enjoyable that peace was that, that I offered to you. And there's going to be a lot of people, I think, that, that say, wait a second, what are you talking about? What, what life uh, did you give me? What, what joy, what peace are you talking about? Why, why didn't you tell me more about this? Why didn't you make it more clear? And I think in that moment, God's going to say, you know, I did. I, I told you all about it. I wrote all about it. I, I made the path into that life and that peace and that joy as clear as I could possibly make it. Why didn't you read it? Why didn't you take it more seriously? The passage that we're studying this morning uh, in Luke is one of those passages that make things very, very clear. And it shows us how, how to enter eternal life with Jesus, uh, shows us how to to, to follow Jesus and experience that peace and that joy that, that only he can give. And it also shows us kind of one of the main ways that we can miss the whole thing. Uh, so if you have a Bible, if you're sitting at home and have a Bible, uh, pick it up, turn with me to Luke chapter 5. 
Luke chapter 5. And I'll read our passage. We're going to look at uh, verses 27 through 39. Luke chapter 5. Begins like this. After this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table with them. And the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And they said to him, the disciples of John fasted often, fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, can you make wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and they, then they will fast in those days. He also told them a parable. No one tears a piece of new garment and puts it on an old garment. If he does, he will tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled and the skins will be destroyed. But new wine must be put into fresh wineskins. And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good. So Levi is a tax collector. Levi, by the way, is Matthew, uh, one of the authors of the Gospels. But Levi is a tax collector, and there were few people in society that were hated more than the tax collectors. This is mostly because they were wealthy, uh, and they were wealthy in a way that everybody would look at them and their, their riches, and they would know that they, they, they got their wealth by exploiting their neighbors. See, Rome was smart with how they collected taxes. Uh, Rome would look at a region like Palestine or a place like where Levi lived, and they would say, this is the amount of money that we need to get from that area. And then they would say to somebody like Levi, it's almost like we would sell a franchise, like we would sell a Runza franchise or a True Value franchise. But Rome would say to somebody like Levi, if, as long as you pay us this amount, then you can make any kind of profit you want above that. And so really Levi would win and Rome would win. And, and so Levi would go out and he would create all sorts of taxes. And he would tax things that Rome didn't necessarily tell him to tax, but his goal was to make as much money as he could over and above what he was going to have to pay to Rome. And so he would make huge profits. And the people knew that he was doing this and they didn't like it. They didn't like him, but they had to pay or they would have Rome to answer to. So he had the power and the backing of Rome. And so Levi really was viewed as a criminal. Uh, in fact, in the Talmud, uh, tax collectors like Levi were considered to be on the same plane as say like a robber or a murderer. These were the unliked people in society. People wanted to remove them. They didn't want to interact with them. They hated to see them. They just considered them to be criminals. And uh, so the point of verse 27, if you look at verse 27, the point of what happens here when it says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi. And he said to Levi, follow me. The point is that Jesus did not view Levi the way society was viewing Levi, which is exactly what was happening with the leper that we looked at last week and the paralytic. The, the point here and the theme that's being developed by Luke is that Jesus has his own view of people. And it's not necessarily what society views or what society thinks of other people. Jesus measures the worth of a person by the fact that they are an image bearer. 
They bear the image of God. And he, he measures their worth by, by what he has planned for them. And the purpose that he has. So he calls Levi to follow him. And Levi's response shows us, and it's just like Peter, it's just like the, the leper and the paralytic. Levi's response shows us that he recognizes the authority and the power of God's word in Jesus. Because Levi immediately leaves everything, rises, and then follows Jesus. It's sort of interesting to look at what the very first step Levi takes. Uh, that first thing that he does here when he follows Jesus is he goes out and he throws a huge party. If you look at uh, verse 29, and Levi made Jesus a great feast in his house. That word great is the word huge. Uh, the word in Greek is actually megalon, which we get the word mega or great or huge from that. So Levi throws this mega party for Jesus, spares no expenses, invites all of his friends and all of his colleagues and uh, kind of raises the question, what was the party about? Like, why did he throw this party? I think if we could ask Levi that question, uh, he would respond to us, are you kidding me? Uh, Jesus invited me, a huge sinner, a person that nobody in our society wants to deal with. Jesus invited me, stopped by my tax booth and invited me to become his disciple. And then I ask him to my house and he says, yes, of course I'm going to throw him a huge party. The grace and the mercy and the kindness of Jesus toward me a sinner absolutely demands that I go all out and throw this huge party. And so he does, and he invites all of his colleagues, uh, which means, again, if you're looking at this from the standpoint of the Pharisees, these are other sinful people. These are other tax collectors. And there's no way, by the way, the Pharisees are going to go into that house. But they're in the scene uh, and they're clearly close enough to the house here where they can watch and they can listen to what Jesus is saying. Uh, but they're doing that with incredible judgment. It's interesting that they don't approach Jesus. Uh, they actually approach his disciples. It says that they go to Jesus' disciples and they grumble at them. Uh, see, to the Pharisees, these type of people that Jesus is eating with they're, they're the reason that Israel is in the dire straits that they're in. When you look at the fact that, that Israel has been conquered by Rome and they're living under the governance and the power of another nation, the Pharisees believed that this was the judgment of God because of the rebelliousness and the sinfulness of people like Levi and these other people sitting at the table. And these are, again, these are sinful people. We shouldn't even have these people in our society because they're taking money that belongs in Israel and they're giving it to Rome and anything above that they're pocketing. We shouldn't have them, but we certainly don't want to acknowledge them or affirm them. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing by having a meal with them is he's acknowledging them and he's affirming them. Um, and this is so important to understand about Jesus. And it's interesting to understand about meals and, and how Jesus views meals. Jesus, throughout the Gospels, is constantly serving up scandal as the main dish of meals like this. If you look at, we're going to look at some of these other stories here, but he, he's eating with women. And in that society, you're not supposed to do that. Some of the women were sinful women. In society's eyes. He breaks bread with tax collectors and sinners. When he talks about banquets, when he talks about heaven, he talks about going out into the alleys and into the streets and picking people up and bringing people from the streets to be at the banquet. This is all incredibly scandalous, but that's kind of how Jesus presents meals. 
Now to the Pharisees, again, in this day, according to their custom, food and meals like this one, they were supposed to be a foreshadowing of heaven, of the great banquet that they would enjoy one day with God. So these religious leaders like the Pharisees, of course, they picture themselves at that banquet. But the assumption would be that, that everybody that's sitting at the table would be righteous, be just like them, be righteous. And the picture of Jesus eating with Levi and his sinner friends was just simply too far away from their picture of, of what the banquet would go, with God would look like and what Jesus ought to be doing in terms of meals and who he eats meals with. Well, Jesus hears their grumbling. Here's the grumbling of the Pharisees, and he answers them. Look at verse 31. It says, Jesus answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Think about it. Who does a physician treat? He treats the sick. Uh, you think about the metaphor of shepherds. Who does the shepherd care for? Who does he leave the flock to go and rescue? He leaves the flock to go rescue the sheep that are lost, that are injured, that are in desperate situations. Jesus is drawing from these images to say, who do you think God is going to go and draw near to and offer forgiveness and restoration? Who do you think God in, in Jesus has come to help? It's the sick. It's the lost. It's those who are desperate for reconciliation to God. And, and Jesus said, those are the ones that I have come to offer forgiveness and offer salvation to. Um, not those who think that they've got it all together. These Pharisees uh, obviously don't like what Jesus is saying here, but they're not getting anywhere with him. And so they take it a different direction. They try to turn it into a, like a theological discussion. Uh, look at what they ask in verse 33. It says, And they said to him, The disciples of John fast often and offer prayers. And so do the disciples of the Pharisees. But yours eat and drink. So they're taking this in a, in a direction here of kind of a theological debate. And really the question for Jesus is, which is it? John is the one that was your forerunner. He's the one that announced you coming. He's connected to your ministry. And he fasted. You know, he carried kind of a sober countenance with him. But we're watching these disciples and they're, they're not only eating with sinners and, and tax collectors, but but they're partying. They're not fasting. They're eating and they're drinking. So which is it? I mean, what, what are you about? Which one of these is the right way? And Jesus understands their question. He understands what they're doing. And he, he actually uses uh, the image of a wedding to answer their objection. Basically saying, listen, weddings are a time for, for partying. Weddings are a time when the, the bride and the groom are together. It's a time for rejoicing. Weddings are a time for loosening the belt, not tightening the belt. And his point is that God's salvation is here. It's in the person of Jesus. And if Jesus is with his people, it's not the time to fast. It's not the time to act somber or sober. It's the time to celebrate. And really, there's a rebuke in this for the Pharisees because they're really challenging, hey, your disciples ought to be more sober. They ought to be fasting. They ought to be in sorrow. And what it's really evidencing is they're missing out on the fact that God's salvation is here. It's in the person of Jesus. And they're on the other side of that. They're missing that. Jesus says there will be a time to fast again soon. 
and he forecasts his death. This is in verse 35. He says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in those days. There will be another time for these disciples to be somber and to fast and to long for the presence of the bridegroom. But right now, in this moment, at this feast, that's not that day. Uh, Jesus is with his people and... um, To fast in this situation would be the wrong orientation toward God at the wrong time. So, Jesus uh, offers two metaphors. He goes on to offer two metaphors uh, to help explain kind of what he's doing and how there's a new day and a new way with God. The first metaphor, the first picture that he offers is the, the picture of an old cloth that needs repair. And the person takes a new piece of cloth to repair the old one. But when you do that, it, it doesn't fit. It doesn't match. Uh, you attach a new cloth to an old cloth, and it's going to render both of them useless. Uh, probably damage the old cloth even more. The next metaphor that Jesus offers is wine and wineskins. Wineskins were typically made of sheepskin or goatskin, and the neck of the animal would typically become the neck of the wineskin. And to make a wineskin, then you'd, you'd skin the animal, you'd remove its hair. They would have ways of treating the, the hide so that when they added the new wine, the hide wouldn't actually taint the taste of the wine. But the point is, a wineskin is made for one wine. So you have a new wine that you add to a new wineskin. And that that new wineskin would would have the strength to be able to to flex and to stretch and to grow as the new wine fermented. Um, Often, by the time the wine had aged, that wineskin would become brittle. It would become more fragile and delicate, which is fine because... It served its purpose. Um, But the whole point here is you never take an old, previously used wineskin and then add new wine to it. Because as the wine ferments, that that old wineskin doesn't have the ability to stretch and flex and it's going to burst and it's going to ruin both. The point to both of these stories that Jesus is making is The old ways of doing life with God cannot be added to the new way of doing life with God now with Jesus without kind of rendering the both ways useless. They just don't fit. There's incredible continuity, obviously, between the old covenant and the new covenant. But now that Jesus is here and he's with his disciples, there's a new way to live life with God. Now, it's interesting, there's a little bit of a rebuke in this to the Pharisees. If you look at verse 39, Jesus says, And no one, after drinking old wine, desires new. For he says, the old is good, or the old is better. And there's a tone of rebuke in here. Jesus realizes he's talking with people who have based their entire lives on the law and how to, on how to look good by doing the things of the law. And they really have developed this, this taste for how the old is better. And so they're reluctant to even wade into the new, even look at Christ, even open up their minds to understand the gospel. And uh, there seems to be a, a rebuke here from Jesus to the Pharisees. So the point to both of these stories is that the old ways cannot be merely added to the new kind of a combining of living under the old covenant to living now under the new covenant with Christ. Now that Jesus is here, he is the point of change. The gospel is the way of living life with God. Now there's obviously tremendous continuity between the old covenant and the new covenant, but There's now a tremendous difference. 
in how someone lives life with God, uh, with the Holy Spirit, following Jesus. This metaphor of the, the wine and the wineskins, I'm guessing, got discussed quite a bit in the uh, early church. We see it in the book of Acts. There's this great debate over how much of Judaism and the law and Jewish tradition did the Gentiles need to pick up if they fully lived in the family of God. And there were disagreements. This is where Paul rebukes Peter. And so I'm guessing that the wine and the wineskin uh, example here was uh, discussed quite a bit in the book of Acts as they were so sorting that out. But Jesus seems to be rebuking the Pharisees with all of this. I would say especially in verse 39 where Jesus says, And no one after drinking old wine desires new, for he says the old is good or the old is better. That, that seems to have a tone of rebuke here because Jesus realizes he's talking with people, these religious leaders who have learned to live life through the law in a way that their entire identity depended on doing good. The way the Pharisees looked at themselves as we're better than others, just look at how well we live out the old covenant or the, the, the law um, was such a dominant way of viewing their lives that Jesus says, listen, for some, they're going to, they're going to say, we don't even want the new wine. We like the old, the old is better. The old is good. And there seems to be a forecasting here that for some, it's going to be awfully hard to break away from the law and now live this life with Jesus as the, the change point. Jesus as God's salvation. I began this morning by saying that this passage here is just one of these passages that makes everything so clear. We talked about how for some, they're going to get to heaven and they're going to face God and God's going to say, hey, what did you do with the, the life and the joy and the peace that I gave you? And for some people, they're going to say, what life, what joy, what peace? I don't know what you're talking about. Why didn't you make that clearer to me? And, and I think God's going to say about a passage like this, I did make it clear. I, I made it as clear as possible. The path was so clear. It's right there in Luke chapter five. See, in, in Luke chapter five here, we have God showing us how to live life and experience joy and peace uh, in salvation with Jesus. Levi is the example of that for us. Levi knew that he was a sinner. He knew that he didn't bring any of his own righteousness to the table. So when Jesus stopped and said to Levi, I want you to follow me, it, the grace and the mercy and the kindness of Jesus absolutely overwhelmed Levi. He saw the words of Jesus as being divinely authoritative. And the compassion and the grace and the mercy just overwhelmed him. And you see that in his response. Immediately after the words of Jesus, he got up and followed. And it's an amazing example of, of what we have an opportunity to do today. That we have the words of Christ and, and we have an opportunity to follow Levi's example and, and follow Jesus. Now, there's another example in this passage. Uh, there's the example of how some people miss the words of Jesus and miss the invitation into the new covenant and the new life with Jesus. That's illustrated in the Pharisees. But this passage also gives us a picture of how to miss this life with Jesus. The Pharisees are the example of that. They heard the words of Jesus. They actually heard the same things that, that the disciples heard. And they saw the same things that the disciples saw. But they couldn't quit their former ways. They didn't see the words of Jesus as divinely authoritative. And they didn't respond in the way that, that Levi and Peter and the leper and the paralytic responded with 
the grace of God is amazing. They stuck to their guns. They stuck to their old ways. And without any humility at all, they, they chose not to surrender to, to the gospel. I just think right now in the middle of this uh, unique season we're in with this coronavirus outbreak, I look at what's happening and I, I absolutely know without a doubt that Jesus is at work in this world. He's changing lives. He's calling people to follow him and to live lives of huge faith. Faith that's, that's motivated by, by incredible mercy and grace. That, that Jesus would actually care about me and invite me to follow him when, when I am such a sinner. Faith that is so full of optimism that says, you know what? There's nothing that can be taken from me. If I die, I get to be with Christ. If I live, then I get to stay. I get to love others. I get to serve others. Um, either way, it's a win for me. I just see this day we're in as, as a, an incredible opportunity to interact with the words of Jesus and the invitation of Jesus and decide for ourselves. You've got to decide and I've got to decide for myself what am I going to do with them? Am I going to have the faith of Levi that was amazed by the grace and the mercy of God that, that left everything, quit my past to follow Jesus? Or am I going to miss the chance? Am I going to be on the other side of the story and just sit back and uh, scoff at others who are living by tremendous faith? I don't want us to miss this opportunity to to hear the words of Jesus and to respond with the faith of Levi. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your incredible love for us that, that you would not only create us and provide for us the way that you do, but you would communicate your love to us so clearly in your word. And we thank you for the invitation uh, that you give to every single one of us to hear the words of Jesus and to see them as, as the words of God and the invitation of, directly from you to follow you and to live a life of incredible faith. And we ask for that, Lord. I, I would ask for that in our community, specifically this week as we face the challenges that we will face as we learn more about where we are as a society and as a nation. We just pray that by your spirit, you would give us incredible faith to love one another, to love you, to follow the words of Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.